Welcome back, everybody. Good evening. Did you guys have some coffee with dinner? I don't, I don't think you're going to fall asleep, however. Um, all right, it is time for our keynote speaker for the evening. And I have the great pleasure of introducing our next speaker. Uh, he has a lifelong interest in the UFO um, subject and has actively investigated and researched the subject for 31 years. He joined the Mutual UFO Network in 1990 as a field investigator trainee in my dining room. I'm my dad. <laughs> I think he's going to tell you a little bit about that. But uh, Since then, he has served as field investigator, state section director, and eventually took over the Illinois State Directorship for Mutual UFO Network and held that for a number of years. Um, he has discussed the UFO subject on numerous radio and television um, news uh, networks and programs. He has assisted the History Channel, Learning Channel, Discovery Channel, Science Channel, Smithsonian Channel, as well as numerous independent UFO documentary productions from various countries. I just realized, I haven't even, this is day one. I don't know what these, these television networks apparently wouldn't exist if we weren't helping them all the time. Yeah. <laughs> He was seen in the Australian Seven News Spotlight show, The Phenomenon, with mainstream journalist Ross Colthart. He also has appeared on live Russian television. Are you bragging about that now? Not right now. It's not a good idea. It was before everything went crazy. Um, the station RTVI to discuss the UFO subject. He has one of the largest personal libraries of UFO books, journals, magazines, newspapers, and microfilms, audio recordings, case files from around the world that cover the last 75 years of our research. With this, he has been examining the detailed history and patterns of the UFO sightings, uh, reports, and phenomenon um, for many, many years now. Evidence of his historical research is, uh, can be found in his acclaimed book, book, Triangular UFOs, An Estimate of the Situation. I think it was uh, the first uh, book written on triangle UFOs ever. And it's, it's, it's an awesome treatise on the subject. You should pick it up. In November of 2020, he became the recipient of the world's single largest historical collection of UFO case files. The files include the historic NICAP and KUFOS case files, in addition to Dr. J. Um, Allen Hynek's original Project Blue Book files. Due to his role as curator for these files and his track record of credible historical research, he was offered the prestigious uh, and rare position of being a full board member for our J Dr. J. Allen Hynek's Center for UFO Studies, which he serves now. He has a bachelor's degree in psychology from Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville. He is a certified hypnotherapist from the Mountain and Johnson Institute of St. Louis. He uh, currently uh, works in the healthcare field for a large New Mexico-based hospital network and resides in Albuquerque, New Mexico with his wife and two daughters. And now for something different. Um, I have the great pleasure of introducing my good friend, David Marler. Forrest always gives a great introduction, and he and I go way back personally as well as professionally. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here. It's I, truly, I always say that it's great to be here, and I mean that sincerely. After COVID, it's really great to be here with real people. <laughs> Two years of doing virtual lectures, virtual meetings, I truly mean it's great to see you in those chairs as real people. I can't emphasize that enough, and I think I speak for all of us. Um, it's, it's great to be here. I want to thank uh, Forrest, obviously, for his introductions. It's funny, after doing this for 31, going on 32 years, the bio gets longer and longer and longer, and I have to wait before I get introduced and come up on stage. 
But I also obviously want to thank Nancy and the entire team here. They put on a great conference, as I'm sure you're realizing this first day, and I think you'll see throughout the weekend. Uh, I have to also thank the AV team. Uh, you know, we've got Ted and Travis and the entire gang back there. As I always like to say, because I've worked with them over the years, they make us look and sound good. So, gentlemen, thank you. Um, it's also nice to uh, be here because I've seen a lot of old friends and I've met a lot of new friends just already today on day one of the conference. Uh, I think that you'll find that this is a great venue for networking and meeting people with shared interest. And I know I see a lot of new faces this year. I'm not going to embarrass you by asking, but I know some of you are probably attending your first UFO conference here. And in fact, there we go. We have a brave soul right here up front. Thank you. Thank you for being here, I really appreciate it. And I thank all of you for your time. Uh, all, everyone's time is very valuable. Um, but this particular venue is very near and dear to my heart. I lecture across the country. I've been on a number of programs, as Forrest has alluded to internationally, but I started attending this conference, thanks to Forrest, uh, in 1992. And I've been attending this event for many, many years off and on. Uh, I started lecturing on the subject of UFOs at this very conference in 2000, which I was remarking at dinner, I can't believe it's been 22 years. It's just insane how fast the time flies by. But I'm also honored, especially honored, to be invited as a keynote speaker, uh, having lectured here many times, to have that distinction. And I share that distinction with my friend and colleague, John Alexander. And in fact, it was 10 years ago at this very conference that John and I first met. Uh, I knew of him, he knew of me, but we had never met before. So again, it provides you that, that avenue to meet people. Um, John expressed interest in the lecture I gave that year, which was on triangular UFOs, the data I had up to that point. He expressed interest, and for those that have read my book, I, I mentioned this in, in the introduction. After I got off stage, I had about five or six people come up and say, I want to buy a copy of your book. I didn't have a book, I didn't reference I had a book, but now I felt maybe I should have a book. I felt very inadequate. Uh, but I thought that that was one of the highest honors uh, for them to just assume naturally that I did have something in written form with regard to my triangular UFO research. And quite literally, again, as I noted in my book, it was leaving this conference flying back to Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I live, that uh, I thought about seriously putting pen to paper. Never thought about writing a book before. I know there's a lot of prolific writers in the field that crank out a new book every six months. Uh, that was never my intent. Um, but I will say, uh, over the last several years and even today, the book still garners a lot of interest. And I would love to say that's because I'm a great writer. I don't think that's actually the answer. I think it's due to the ubiquitous nature of these triangular UFOs. We have consistently had reports of these. Uh, you're going to hear a fantastic presentation this weekend uh, by Cheryl and Linda Costa, who have looked at the statistical data as it pertains to triangular UFOs and other UFO types. I highly encourage you to catch that lecture because they, like myself, like to focus on the data. And I think that's very important. We're going to touch on that in, in the course of the introduction. Um, but tonight, we're going to continue the examination of looking at these triangular UFOs, whatever they are. Uh, mainly because, as Forrest alluded to in the introduction, I have an entire new subset of data. Data that goes back to the 1940s. Data that has never been looked at with the express purpose of looking for other historical triangular UFO reports. My friend and colleague Barry Greenwood, who's one of the leading historians on the subject, he told me, he goes, you do know you're the first researcher to really go through those historic files with the express purpose of looking for that subset of UFO types. And I said, well, I'm happy to do so. I'm equally happy to be able to present those cases for the first time. If you read the synopsis to the lecture, these are case files that have never been seen by the general public. Unless you went to CUFOS headquarters uh, up in Chicago starting in 1973 when they were founded, you would never have the ability to see these case files. So I'm happy to gather them together, collate them, and share them with you tonight literally for the first time ever. This is the first time I'm giving this new presentation. I also feel duty bound, and normally I've told friends and colleagues I don't like to waste time on this, but since I have two hours as keynote speaker, uh, I have a little bit of a buffer as far as my time goes. Uh, I feel duty bound to address some of the explanations, so-called explanations, of these triangular UFOs. Many people are saying they're all military, and they're citing certain references. 
We're going to look at that. We're going to look at it with critical thinking skills because the explanations or so-called explanations uh, quite often don't hold water. And so we're going to look at that in the context of looking at the historical narrative. And so with that, I'd like to begin. And pardon me, I didn't have to wear these when I started 22 years ago, but I, I really need them now, so I apologize. Um, the title is Triangular UFOs, New Historical Cases and Validated Insights. And again, if you've read the synopsis of the program guide with regard to the lecture, uh, the characteristics that I outlined in 2013 in writing my book, I was shocked and amazed to find in this whole new subset of data. It was the best outside validation for my research, and I, I'm really anxious to share that with you. Before we do so, though, I, I just want to, on a personal note, share something with you. Um, this is uh, my uh, Uncle Jerry and Aunt Gloria. Um, like many UFO researchers and lecturers who you will see this weekend, my family's not a big supporter of the efforts that, that I am engaged in with regard to UFO research. Uh, they usually just kind of casually smile and nod and move on. Uh, the only exceptions are my wife and my two daughters. My two daughters, 12 and 14, are now research assistants in my research room and uh, really enjoy kind of bringing them up into the subject matter. Um, but in addition to that, my, like I said, my sister has been a huge supporter of mine. And other than them, really, it was my aunt, uh, uh, aunt Gloria and Uncle Jerry who would always you know, compel me to continue doing what you're doing. Oh, I hear you're going to be on the History Channel. That's great. Just keep doing the research. It's really important. Um, like many of you, though, you know, over the last two years with COVID, uh, we lost uh, Jerry, uh, my Uncle Jerry, in the holiday year of 2020 around Christmas. And just this past uh, holiday season, 2021, we lost my Aunt Gloria to COVID as well. So again, uh, many people have been impacted either directly or indirectly. And I just feel because they were so supportive of me over the years that I want to dedicate this lecture to their memory. So thank you. And I think they're here with us now, hopefully enjoying this presentation. So. I thought about the title for this lecture, and I, again, because of coming out of COVID, I thought a good title would be, What Did David Do During COVID Lockdown? And what I did was do a lot of historical research, more so than I probably would have done uh, otherwise. Um, going into 2020, uh, Election Day, November 3rd, a lot of heightened anxiety on both political sides, right, with regard to the presidential election. I was anxious. Not only for the presidential election, I was anxious for another reason. Uh, these are just some of the files I had prior to that day. This is just a small portion of the archive that I have in Albuquerque. Uh, but I was anxious because I was going to have the arrival of this moving truck. And this moving truck had contained within it, as Forrest mentioned, the largest single collection of historical UFO case files in the world. And you can only imagine, I was like a kid on 10 Christmases rolled into one. Uh, this is uh, the movers putting all of the file cabinets in place. And I'll give you a little bit of detail with regard to what was in that collection. So uh, as Forrest mentioned in the introduction, these are the case files from the Center for UFO Studies, the organization founded by Dr. J. Allen Hynek. It's also the files of the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomenon, uh, one of the largest historical collections uh, uh, with regard to NICAP going back to the 1950s. Uh, also, a lesser known group shown there in the middle, uh, Civilian Saucer Intelligence of New York, or CSI New York, not the TV show, but the UFO organization. The original CSI, thank you, yes. They actually were formed even before NICAP. NICAP didn't come along until the end of 1956, but CSI New York was actually active in the early to mid-50s. And we have all of their original case files, correspondence, witness sketches. I, I can't tell you what a treasure trove this is. And you see me sitting there between those file cabinets. That's about where I spend most of my time until my wife comes looking for me. Um, those file cabinets are filled, four and five drawer file cabinets, 15 total that they delivered. Thousands of case files contained therein, in addition to news clippings. And I'll share some other details with you momentarily. But I like to say that this field uh, is, has no shortage of data. We are not a data <laughs> short uh, research field. We have lots of data that we can look at. 
while I was going through this material, as you can appreciate, over the last month and years, uh, this is what occurred. June 25th, right, the Pentagon UFO UAP report. And Forrest alluded to this at the beginning of the conference. As he, said, as he stated, the official seal of approval, UFOs are real. UAPs, whatever they are, do exist, and they have done incursions within military operations areas. Many people were disappointed by this report, and as I've said on many interviews and on various news programs, I think the people that were disappointed had their expectations set too high. Uh, in interviews that I had done prior to its release, I said, I think we need to temper our expectations. I don't say that arbitrarily, I say that because we have decades worth of denials on the part of the United States government, as well as other governments of the world with regard to the subject. However, despite the, what, six pages total, I believe it was, uh, not really uh, very hefty, uh, despite the lack of information, uh, the fact that there was official acknowledgement of the phenomenon is interesting. And for those of us that have been doing this for years and decades, you need to compare that to the historical narrative with regard to what the Air Force typically said. And it harkens back to December 1969 when Air Force Project Blue Book shut down, and these were their conclusions. The conclusions of Project Blue Book were, one, no UFO reported, investigated, and evaluated by the Air Force has ever given any indication of threat to our national security. Two, there is no evidence submitted that sightings categorized as unidentified represent technological developments or principles beyond the range of present-day scientific knowledge. And three, there is no evidence indicating that these unidentified objects are extraterrestrial. Now, when you look at the UAP report, even though, again, it's, it lacks in substance, I would argue that directly or indirectly, it refutes every one of those conclusions. The mere fact that the UAP report exists was predicated on looking at UAPs as a threat or potential threat to national security. The report goes on to state that it is a national security threat as well as an air safety threat. It also goes in the UAP report and talks about the fact that our scientific understanding may not fully understand or appreciate the UAP phenomenon. With regard to the last statement, they don't say it's extraterrestrial, but we do have that wonderful, clear, clearly defined category called other, which lends to any and all possibility. So it's very interesting in the sense that we've now shifted. And uh, again, it has changed. The, it's been a sea change moment with regard to the UFO subject. Uh, and as a result, I will tell you, I've had people visit my uh, UFO research room since that report came out. I did a local radio show uh, for Albuquerque radio station, and it was a call-in show. I had a gentleman call in and claimed that he was a retired lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. And he said, David, I would love to see Dr. Hynek's original Project Blue Book material. I said, well, get with the producer offline, get your information. And I said, let's try to, try to meet up if we can get our calendars to work. About three to four weeks after that, not only did he show up, but he brought a retired colonel in the Air Force who was in charge of advanced weapons development for the Air Force. I've been doing this for 31 years, or 30 years up to that point. Never had uh, retired Air Force officers wanting to come to my home to talk about the UFO subject. And that's just one example where things are changing. More people are willing to come forward and engage in the discussion on the subject. But it really got me thinking, with the current state of ufology, uh, there's a lot of new players coming into this, and I started really thinking about, well, what's the breakdown? I've been doing this for you know, over three decades. How would I break down the UFO community? And I started thinking to myself, well, uh, we have the uh, UFO believers, if I can use that term, and in that group, there's healthy belief, people that, like yourself, are curious, compelled by the information, and feel that there could be something to this UFO subject, or you've had your own personal experiences. Uh, then there's also the unhealthy belief. And the best example I can think of are the 39 members of the Heaven's Gate UFO cult that committed ritual suicide in March of 1997. Now, you may think that that's an abstract, abstract example. I'm here to tell you, and Forrest can remember this as well, as well as a few, a few of my friends that were here, we had members of that cult here at this very conference in a year or two preceding their ritual suicide, trying to recruit members. 
So it is a very close to home example of where unhealthy belief can lead you. So a cautionary tale to be sure. Then we also have the UFO skeptics, the flip side of the believers, and we have healthy skepticism. I welcome anyone who is skeptical about UFOs but are at least willing to look at the data. And we have many of those. And many skeptics have actually kept UFO researchers honest with errors in our judgment or leaps of faith in looking at the data. But then you have the oppositional skeptics. These people have come out of the woodwork since the Pentagon UFO report have come out. They've been prolific on television. They've been prolific on the internet. These are people that if you say white, they're going to say black. Why? Because you said white. They just want to pick an argument and have an argument for argument's sake. And that doesn't budge the needle of understanding with regard to this UFO subject. Then you have the UFO agnostics. And I can appreciate these people. These are people that UFOs, maybe, maybe not. It doesn't impact my life. At least most people think that. And I can appreciate that. In, in, in most settings, uh, people probably don't feel that it impacts their life. Uh, but they don't necessarily go after the UFO believers or necessarily go after the UFO skeptics. Then you have this group, and this has really developed in, in the last uh, year or so since the Pentagon UFO report came out, UFO sensationalists. And I break this group down into pseudo-researchers. I know some of these people personally. They have only been in the subject for a year or two, but they're on the Discovery Channel and all these different networks doing shows, and I personally know from their own mouth that they're being interviewed as so-called experts and they were paid to read cue cards. I like to call these people, pardon this, this, this description, meat puppets. <laughs> the producer sticks their hand up their backside and makes their mouth move. The sad thing is, for the average viewer, you don't know the difference between who's credible and who's not. And again, that just muddies the water when we're trying to have an understanding of this subject. Then we also have the con artists and hoaxers. And there's a long litany of that going back to the very beginning of the modern age of UFOs. People just simply trying to make a buck, outright lying, outright fabricating information and stories. Then we have the UFO researchers. You have UFO investigators, like my friends here from MUFON, that are out doing field investigations, actually collecting as much information as soon as an event, a UFO event occurs, and I commend their efforts. Then you have people like myself, US, UFO historians that have access to lots of documentation uh, going back to 1947, if not before. And then UFO theorists, people that don't do in-field investigations, but they don't do historical research, but people like physicists that might want to look at trying to understand the propulsion technology of UFOs. They're looking at one particular aspect of the UFO phenomenon. But then we come to this category, and this is the new group that suddenly popped up since the Pentagon UFO report, UAP scientists. And I'm very careful about that, not UFO scientists. They don't want to have that term UFO associated. They're UFO researchers, we're UAP scientists. And they want to make that clear distinction. Now, this falls into two groups. You have a lot of institutions, uh, such as NASA, that have made several statements stating that they're going to look at the UAP subject. But then you also have individuals, and uh, Mark D'Antonio, I think this morning, had mentioned Dr. Avi Loeb. That is probably one of the best examples of a, an individual scientist, in this case, astronomer from Harvard, working to develop the Galileo project. And so I welcome them into the fold, but with one caveat. The UAP scientists, whether institutional or individual, They've all made statements, we do not wish to look at the past, but we'll focus efforts on cases currently and moving forward. Don't want to look at history. Don't want to look at the past. Well, they may be very smart scientists, but I think it's really strange that we are on the 75th anniversary of the modern age of UFOs. It was, you know, June 24th, 1947, Kenneth Arnold had his famous sighting. We call it the birth of the modern age of ufology. If we're honest with ourselves, it was the birth of our awakening to the subject. It has probably been here for a very, very long time, but 47 was really where the culture woke up to this uh, subject matter. And so I would argue now more than ever, it's important to appreciate the history of the mystery, as my friend Philip Mantle in the UK likes to call it. And uh, it's really interesting when you think about 75 years, seven and a half decades of United States, 
foreign government UFO files, as well as United States and foreign civilian UFO investigators collecting data and putting it together to try to make sense of this mystery. And so uh, I'll be touching on Philip Mantle towards the very end of the presentation because I do have some exciting updates to tell you about. But opening these case files and looking, there are numerous reports. Now, just like any UFO researcher or historian will tell you, within those files, there's a huge percentage of meteors and fireballs. Obviously, prosaic things that can be easily explained away, but people honestly reported them as UFOs. So there's a lot of clutter in the data that we have to sift through. But it's really interesting because when you look at those case files, going back to 1947 and going through the 40s and into the 50s, uh, we didn't have reports of cattle mutilations or crop circles or government conspiracies. Those came later. And when you think about it, these case files are really the spine or the backbone or the cornerstone of the subject matter. It all started with people seeing unidentified aerial objects in the sky. So to summarily discount these sighting reports in seven and a half decades worth, I think is ridiculous in the extreme. I always like to liken it to the fact, if I'm a criminal investigator from Baltimore, Maryland, and I decide to move with my wife and kids out to Oregon, and I go to the new police uh, precinct that I'm gonna be working at, and they've had a string of burglaries. And I walk in, and imagine going with that same mindset. I know you've had a lot of burglaries over the last year or two, but I don't wanna know about them. I don't wanna know where they happened. I don't wanna know the method of entry. I don't wanna know what they stole. I don't wanna know how they fenced the goods. I only wanna know about cr crimes moving forward. It's ridiculous. The past may provide context for the present and the future with regard to UFO sightings. And there may be patterns in the data. For those that have read my book, you know that there are patterns. But there's documentation in many forms. I just, I really feel like I wanna share this archive with you as much as I can through being here. The documentation that exists in these files, we have handwritten uh, UFO reports. We have typewritten UFO reports from all over the, the globe. We have uh, signed and notarized uh, affidavits attesting to people's UFO sightings. That's how seriously they took some of these. Newspapers, thousands of newspaper articles, news teletypes. We have crude UFO eyewitness sketches. We also have some rather artistic ones like this. There's some beautiful artwork. In fact, I thought about just doing a, a whole book on the artwork from these files because some of it's quite striking. Uh, we also have the original, in some cases, government files from Dr. J. Allen Hynek. Uh, it's amazing to find some of the original documents signed by the commanding officer of some of these Air Force bases, not photostats, not carbon copies. We also have, obviously, UFO photos. Uh, what UFO files wouldn't be complete without that. But we often think about photographs, but we also have some great audio. I've just in the last year and a half, digitized and digitally remastered over 265 reel-to-reel -reel recordings going back to the 1950s. Many of these are interviews with UFO eyewitnesses, and I've been able to pair those up with some of the case files. Uh, we even have emails from the time, emails in the 40s, 50s sense, in the form of Western Union telegrams. So talk about a sign of the times, you know, looking at some of these old uh, Western Union telegrams, it's rather funny to find those now. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention my colleagues. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Jan Aldridge and Mr. Barry Greenwood, who I'm on the phone with almost every day, if, if not every other day. And they are two of the leading historians on the UFO subject. Each one in their own right has extensive files and archives, and we're doing a lot of data sharing. Uh, in September, they actually stayed at my home and were living researchers for two straight weeks. And during that time, they scanned over 33,000 pages of case files. And that's just a drop in the bucket to what we're still trying to work on. These are some of the original audio recordings going back to the 1950s, courtesy of Rod Dyke, another uh, collaborator in this attempt to preserve history and share it with the general public. And that's just my little studio table there where I do a lot of the digitization work. So I just wanted to share that with you. But it's imperative that we start doing this work because I can share some examples. These are newspaper photostats going back to this one, 1949, and you can see how it's starting to fade. 
We have other examples where some of the early chemically treated photocopies actually start to have chemical corrosion that starts to occur. And then we have sad examples like this where you can barely read the headline, sky object seen, but not much else in the news clipping. And looking at other pages next to those, not only do the pages themselves degrade, the pages next to them in the files are actually chemically burned, where we lose data with successive or adjoining pages. And so that's really sad to see. And then this is an example, which I actually had to call Barry and Jan. I said, you're not going to believe what just happened. They're like, what? I said, I was digitizing this tape. And by the way, this one was a Charleston, West Virginia radio station from January 1958, interviewing UFO witnesses of their sightings from that time. And as I was running the tape through the machine, I'm looking down, right, making a note, and all of a sudden I see this confetti flying up and landing on my paper. And I look up, and quite literally, as the tape was going through the machine, it was disintegrating. The magnetic strip that was attached to the vinyl backing was flaking off. And as it was going through the cap stand, it was just, it was like a confetti machine. It would be funny if it wasn't so tragic. The good news is I had started the software application to digitize it, and I was able to actually capture the recording, which is good because, as you can see, there was no second chance on this one. But you can literally see the tape disintegrating right before your eyes and splintering. And that was a really sad example, but we got the recording, and I'm very happy because some very interesting narratives contained in there. So really the goals of myself, Barry, Jan, and, and Rod are to collect, preserve the historical UFO data, shell, share it with fellow researchers worldwide and colleagues, digitally scan the materials so we can widely share them. Ultimately, what we want to do is have a digital archive free of charge. <laughs> Mark, Mark, Dian, Mark D'Antonio was saying that you know, he does his, his uh, software uh, so you can see astronomy free of charge. We do not want to charge for this either. We want to eventually get a server where we can have all of this historical digital material available for a worldwide UFO community. That's the ultimate goal. And use this material for research and educational purposes like what I'm going to share with you today. So going back just briefly to the UAP report, I don't know if most of you have seen this yet, but John Greenwald, in his efforts as usual, was able to secure the classified but redacted UAP report. How many people, did you get a chance to see that yet? It's available online. Uh, yeah, good luck reading it, right? Um, but what I found interesting is the fact, the category headings, common shapes and less common irregular shapes. This was not a page that was part of the original Pentagon UAP report. And I'm here to tell you, I wish I could look beneath the redactions because if we could, I would argue Triangular UFOs must be one of those common shapes reported. And I only say that based on what we're seeing within the civilian sector of UFO UAP research. And triangles obviously take on many different shapes and sizes. You know, you have the isosceles, the equilateral, you have rounded triangles, you know, bulging triangles, ones with little dips, one with notches. And I have had many readers contact me worldwide and say, well, do you consider V-shaped or chevron-shaped or boomerang-shaped in that category? In my book, I really tried to stay true to triangles, but for those that are seeing this either live or virtually with us tonight, I thought I would share a few of the boomerang or chevron-shaped cases that I found in the historical case files. And so with that, uh, I'd like to just reference my book. I did bring a few copies of my book for anybody that's interested. I don't have a table. Just feel free. I'll be here all weekend. Feel free to reach out if you'd like to have one. Um, and this was the culmination of my research up to 2013. And, you know, it's been nine years ago, and uh, I hope to clarify the subject even further with the information today. Uh, in my book, I cite cases going back to the early 20th and even late 19th century, and we're going to look at some additional cases today. But I wrote the book in the hopes of dispelling a lot of misstatements, false assumptions that I saw on social media and the Internet. And unfortunately, even to this day, I still see those same statements and arguments. And again, tonight I feel duty bound to try to dispel some of these ideas or beliefs with evidence, with information that's completely contradictory. One is that all triangular UFOs look the same. And you get this image when you think about, let me move that cursor there, there we go. 
when you think about triangular UFOs, this is the typical image that you often see or that you hear about. But not all triangles look the same. There are differences in the shape. There's differences in the size. We have small triangles, large triangles. The color of the triangles uh, will often change. Uh, quite often, there's complete absence of lights, and rather the entire object is glowing a specific color. I have many modern day accounts of that. And the lighting configurations, that one probably more so than any. There's different lighting characteristics, although this is probably one of the more modern day prevalent ones that you see. But also the idea that the triangles are something new. People say, well, people weren't seeing triangles decades ago. Wrong. Uh, again, for those that have read my book, you know better. Uh, Michael, my friend Michael's out there. He knows. He's, he's read my book. Um, but I'm going to share with you some historical files that completely dispel this idea. And they often use the triangles or something new to bolster this false idea that all triangles are military in origin. They're all developments of Department of Defense here in the United States. And when we think about that, we often hear of the purported quote-unquote TR-3B, and I feel like we just need to touch on that briefly. Where does the TR-3B story start? This has become a pervasive urban myth within UFO lore. You'll see it all the time. On, if, it, if someone posts a YouTube video of a triangle, oh, it's just the TR-3B, like we just know it exists. It's like, oh, it's a 72 Chevy. Um, it's not the case. Um, in fact, the story can be traced back to one solitary individual. His name was Edgar Fouché, and he was in the military, and he claims to have worked at Area 51. And I think there's ample documentation that surfaced that proves that he did. Great. Uh, he claims that we back-engineered these triangles purportedly from recovered ET technology in the 1980s and the 1990s. And he goes on and states that you know, the TR-3B has these exotic properties. He even goes into detail describing how the propulsion technology works. I'm not questioning the man's credentials, but I am questioning the claims of the TR-3B because he has absolutely no evidence to support that story. And so when we look at it, and by the way, uh, Mr. Fouché died in May of 2017, so unfortunately we can't ask him here to uh, really uh, ask him to provide information or detail. But he started doing lectures in the 1990s at UFO conferences and provided images like this. But I, I have to ask, are we to believe a US defense contractor could divulge sensitive military secrets, if true, and not incur severe penalties as a result? I have talked to many people that work for Boeing, Lockheed, Northrop, and you go through excruciating security checks, and they continually will check up on you. And if you divulge sensitive information, there are penalties and even involving fines and imprisonment. Um, people will say, though, well, if the government took action against him, it would prove he was telling the truth. That's a false argument. If you go with that argument, then there's no point in having security clearances. So what you're saying is, we're going to enact security clearances for you. You can't violate these, but if you do, we're not going to do anything about it. It's just ridiculous. So the TR-3B I'm not impressed with. Another one that often comes up is the so-called stealth blimp. Now, this one may actually have more of a basis in reality. This actually goes back to uh, the September 1999 issue of Popular Mechanics seen here. And some people have suggested that this might be an explanation for some of the triangular UFOs. Again, this thing, if it exists, didn't actually come into development until the 1980s, late 1980s, early 1990s. But what about triangular UFO reports prior to that time? And insofar as blimps or lighter-than-air vehicles, I have some fundamental issues. If you look at it visually, yes, that looks like a dark, large triangle. I, I will concede that. But many of these triangles are seen to hover and then rapidly accelerate. Lighter-than-air vehicles do not have the structural integrity to withstand the, the g-force and to withstand the wind shear of uh, rapid accelerations like that. There's a reason that they move slow, because they're designed to just lumber along. Uh, so there's fundamental issues with regard to that. Adding to the confusion, this is something that I've had people often reference. Well, we have these patents, so we know that these triangles are man-made. There, there have been patents filed on triangular uh, aero, aerospace concepts or platforms, if you will. Uh, one that you'll see on the internet, you can look these up, is one filed by a gentleman in San Juan, Puerto Rico for a quote-unquote triangular spacecraft. And wow, doesn't that look like the triangular UFOs that we're familiar with, if you've seen the, the reports on the internet. 
The problem was this wasn't filed until 2004 and it wasn't published until 2006. How does that explain the January 5th, 2000 case that I personally investigated in Southern Illinois? It doesn't. Looking at another patent, Salvatore Pice, who's a well-known aerospace engineer, he actually filed a patent for a, quote, craft using an inertial mass reduction device, unquote. This was filed even later in 2016 and not published until 2018. Again, how can that explain the Belgian UFOs? How can that explain Hudson Valley in the 1980s? It can't. Moving on, looking at other examples, when you look at the argument for patents, some people use these as an argument for the military explanation. The fact is, again, these reports preceded the patents. Uh, many of the reports have. And this is a, a very important point. And I have a friend that's in the, the patent office. A patent is not evidence of a working model. It's simply a conceptual idea on paper. It goes from idea to patent to a prototype to a working model. And that's assuming you're successful. You may have an idea that will not have a patent issued. If you get a patent issued, it doesn't mean it's going to develop into a prototype, let alone a full working model. So to say, here's a patent, that explains it, is a little bit ridiculous, in my opinion. And again, timing is everything. Even if these were real and valid, you know, you can't use this to uh, explain away sightings that have been occurring for decades previously. And proponents of these theories fail to realize or refuse to look at the historical data or are unaware of it. Now, there is an important thing I need to state because I've said this on many different podcasts and other, different, uh, other shows and other conferences. Whereas I question the previous military explanations, I concede that we may be seeing in the mix of triangular UFO reports some military aircraft, not demonstrating these exotic properties as we will see, but one of the best examples I can think of is this photo, which was taken by an amateur photographer, Jeff Templin, in Wichita, Kansas. And blowing this up a little bit more for you, clearly you can see a triangular object here, but you also have this characteristic contrail, suggestive of typical jet aircraft propulsion. So, yes, I think we may be looking in some cases at the next generation stealth technology, but again, it doesn't explain the vast number of unusual characteristics that these triangles exhibit. Now, my research into triangles really took off during the pandemic when I had Chris Mellon come out to my home. We filmed in the fall of 2019 and it aired in tw the summer of 2020. And for those that didn't see, I just wanna share a quick clip because I'm gonna use this as a springboard to discuss what we're gonna cover this evening. Now, quite often you hear UFO researchers on these TV shows make statements like that, and it's really up to you to believe them. It's hard to fact check them in some cases. But in making that statement, and with the new available data I have, I thought I would try to demonstrate showing you the case files I have to back up that statement, that it's not just an empty statement being thrown out there. But also, there was a fundamental issue, uh, in my opinion, with this episode, and by the way, I enjoyed this. I did uh, have a conversation with Chris on the triangular UFO subject about two or three years prior. He reached out to me and wanted to talk to me about my research. He had read my book and it was very complimentary. He has a true personal interest in, that, in this particular subset of the UFOs, the, the triangular UFOs. So it was really great that we were able to finally meet and he could see some of my case files. But the problem was, uh, Despite the fact that this was aired internationally, I subsequently received hundreds of additional triangular UFO reports that many of those uh, purportedly dated back to 1970 and earlier. Uh, I had contemporaneous reports from the 1970s and the Nightcap Kufos case files, which are even more compelling. It's one thing for a UFO witness to call me up tomorrow and say, I saw one in 1973, as opposed to going into the historic files and finding a report that was filed in 1973. Uh, I find that to be much more compelling. But the issue that I had with this episode was a skeptical claim made, and uh, I'd love to get your input on this. UK researcher David Clark made the following statement, and I have to read it word for word. I just, it still gets me. From the 1970s onwards, you get this increasing trend of people to see giant triangular objects or wedge-shaped objects. And I think the easiest place to look for an answer is popular culture. He goes on to state, 
And the film I remember seeing from childhood, which had a huge triangular or wedge-shaped object, was the very first Star Wars film. When was that released? 1977. You get the huge Imperial Star Destroyer coming into view. And then finally he states, strangely enough, this is the same period of time that people start seeing these huge, dark, triangular-shaped objects with pulsing lights moving silently across the countryside at night. Easiest place to look for an answer. Well, easiest is not always the most accurate place to look for an answer. And the fact is, there's a rich history of these triangular UFOs prior to the year 1977 and the release of Star Wars. And so in doing this historical review, based on his comment, I decided I'm going to systematically go through the NICAP KUFOS case file starting in 47 up to 1977 when Star Wars was released and see if there's any cases. To my surprise, uh, there were over 102 reports and we're going to look at some of the more intriguing ones. But before we do, this really touches on this whole issue of belief versus reality. And we live in an interesting time right now where people have beliefs devoid of reality and certainly the UFO subject is no different. I always like to say it doesn't matter what you believe regarding UFOs if the data doesn't support that belief. I mean, we have to look at the data. Or in the case of David Clark, where, as I will show you, the data is completely contradictory to his previous statement that these weren't reported until 1977. What matters are the facts. And what does the research data reflect? And I emphasize research for a reason. I go to a lot of military uh, archives. I go to a lot of libraries, a lot of UFO collections, historians. I have my own vast archive. I look at the data. I don't go, it doesn't matter what I believe. I've said that many, many times. It only matters what I can share with you in the form of data. And I like to say that because some people talk about their research. And research is not surfing the internet looking at UFO videos. That's entertainment. Uh, I just can't emphasize that enough. I've had people, oh, I go on the internet and I do my research. It's just like, it's cringeworthy when I hear that sometimes. But I'm not going to pretend to say I'm the first person that's done research on triangular UFOs. In fact, it goes all the way back to the 1950s. For those that have seen previous lectures, I've shared this. This was one of the earliest articles devoted to triangular UFOs from Flying Saucer Review, their May-June 1959 issue. And what's interesting is in this, they reported these triangular UFOs are what they called unidentified deltas, it was the name they used in the UK at the time. And they discussed some of these triangles as being as large as 300 feet in length, which is interesting because modern reports describe oftentimes that they're estimated to be around 300 feet in length. As if that wasn't good enough, there was actually a follow-up article by the same uh, author. Uh, six years later, they described these triangles or delta volants, another name for this subset, moving edge forward. And here you can see a triangle with an arrow going this direction. Uh, many of these triangles, historically as well as modern reports, they're described as moving with the flat side as the leading edge, which is completely counterintuitive if you're thinking of an aerodynamic form, cutting or slicing through the air. I have some really intriguing ones to share with you, including some audio recordings related to that. Um, but looking at triangular UFOs, they've been called unidentified deltas, they've been called delta valance, they've been called silent Vulcans. And for those that are familiar with aircraft, there was the Vulcan bomber in the UK in the 50s, 60s, which was a huge triangular shape. And I have an image I'll share with you momentarily. Flying triangles, or FTs, the late Omar Fowler was a personal friend of mine, and we shared information in the early years of my research before he passed away. He would call them FTs. Uh, Dudley Dorito, this is probably one of the more interesting names that was given. This was given to the subject during a wave of sightings in the early mid-2000s in the UK. They were calling him the Dudley Dorito. Uh, and I like to call them triangular UFOs because I'm old school, but for those that like the new terminology, triangular UAPs. But whatever you call them, these are the common characteristics that I outlined in my book. And the primary characteristics are those that occur more often. Secondary characteristics are common but less common than the first column. Just briefly, beams of light emitted. These can be spotlights or beams of light, laser beams that are seen to come out of these triangles. Uh, the three bright lights at each point, again, one of the more characteristic lighting patterns. The large size, and we're going to hear some very interesting descriptions from the historical case files. The ability of these things to hover, 
These objects can also make flat turns as opposed to banking like a conventional aircraft. Uh, silent flight. Some cases these objects are estimated to be only 500 feet above the witness's head and they state if I didn't look up, I wouldn't have known the object was there. The slow speed. Witnesses stated they could walk down the sidewalk and keep up with the object. It clearly wasn't any type of conventional aircraft in that regard. Uh, sharp turns at high speed, rapid acceleration. Secondary characteristics, associated sounds. This can be buzzing, humming, very unusual descriptions sometimes with these objects. And ob the fact that these triangles are seen with non-triangular UFOs. They've been seen with rectangular objects, they've been seen with orbs or balls of light, uh, electromagnetic effects, multiple triangular UFOs. I have a lot of these I'm going to share with you from the historical files. Colored glowing underside. As I mentioned, some of these triangles have no lights as such, but the object was glowing. The entire underside of the object was reportedly glowing different colors. Erratic movement. Uh, this is often described as a zigzag maneuver horizontally or vertically. They'll sometimes be seen to make a stair step maneuver up or down. Uh, we also have uh, the uh, blunt end forward movement, as I mentioned, detachable lights and objects, which you'll hear about in the historical reports, Structure, uh, superstructure observed. People would say, I looked underneath this thing and there were girders or pipes. It didn't look aerodynamic as we would think. And then shape-shifting, one of the most unusual characteristics. Quite often we get UFO reports that seem to change shape. Sometimes it's just simply due to the, the relative position of the object to the observer, but many of these cases, clearly the object is, is morphing or changing. And I think Ray Hernandez touched on this during his presentation prior to the dinner break about, you know, we're dealing with something that isn't just nuts and bolts. Uh, these things clearly are highly anomalous in nature. So as we review the following cases, and we're gonna do rapid fire like speed dating, uh, we're going to look at these reports and keep in mind all of these were filed during a time where flying discs and flying saucers were the prevalent object being reported at the time. These reports have never been seen by the general public with the exception of a couple that I threw in for people that might be here for the first time that have not caught my lecture. As I mentioned, uh, these are cases out of over a hundred that I've been able to recently discover. It, we'll review these chronologically. And despite variations, you're going to see the commonalities. At the top of each one, you'll see a, a black box in red letters, and those are the characteristics from the list that I showed you that are exemplified in these cases. And again, this is meant to be a high-level uh, overview, but if you see a UFO report that I touch on and you're from that area and you're like, I'd really like to learn more about that, get with me during the conference. I can certainly get you the information. I'm happy to email any of these case files to you if you'd like to learn more. So again, I, I'm just going to kind of tease you with each one of these. So with that, let, let's dive in and let's begin. The first one I'd like to touch on, this is actually from Dr. J. Allen Hynek's personal files. Uh, and just briefly so you know, the red felt marker or pen right here is typically what Heineck would make his notations with. Uh, and I, I'm very familiar with his handwriting now. You can see here Delta Wing Craft, and this was a case from Carson Sink, Nevada, uh, July 24th, 52. And this was actually observed by two Air Force pilots who saw three Delta Wing shaped or arrowhead shaped objects. And people may see Nevada or Groom Lake and think, Area 51. But the problem was, this was three years before the establishment of Groom Lake facility. So this was before that time. However, we did have a lot of military activity and bases in the area. And so in this particular case, this is just a blow up here, uh, despite the fact that they, they were triangular or wedge shaped or arrowhead shaped, uh, they, know, they stated that they were aware of the latest US experimental aircraft and these objects did not conform to any of them. Drawings of U.S. experimental aircraft were shown to the two officers, but not one of the experimental aircraft shown was identified as possibly being the unidentified objects. But let's just say for the sake of argument, it could have been Delta Wing aircraft. And I use this as an initial example because I would be remiss if I didn't mention that during the 50s and 60s, the time frame we're looking at, there was huge developments in aviation with regard to Delta Wing aircraft. In uh, the United States, we had the F-102 Delta Dagger. The Australian Air Force was using the Dassault Mirage III uh, on contract through the French government. The Vulcan bomber, which I alluded to earlier, has a nice large triangular appearance. And then the MiG-21 in uh, the Soviet Union 
also had a relative triangular shape. But admittedly, you still have fuselage here, you still have vertical stabilizers, you still have contrails, uh, smoke coming from these things. Uh, I don't think they're explanations for some of the cases that we're going to be looking at. But one of the most interesting, which I can guarantee was not a Delta Wing fighter, was Albany, Georgia, January 28th, 53. Wait, I, was that a coffee you said? I'm sorry? Was that a coffee? Yes, that's one of Dr. Hynek's, that's one, which is which one a copy? Well, I know that you can't write with red because the laser can't pick it up when you make a coffee. So they would always say red and black or blue. Oh yeah, well these are, these are copies of the, the blue book files, but I have the originals uh, of Dr. Hynek's. So that's his actual handwriting on, on the page. Okay, so as we look at these though, uh, in this particular case, this was Albany, Georgia, January 28, 53. We had an Air Force pilot that was flying at night who observed a circular light that was alternating white, orange, white, orange. And what's interesting is, as we zoom in here, he goes on to state that during the last three minutes of the sighting, the object changed colors, white to orange repeatedly. The last 15 seconds, uh, the observer said the object changed to a deep red color and triangular in shape. This object split into two triangles, one immediately above the other, and disappeared. Very unusual. Doesn't sound like a Delta Wing fighter to me. What's interesting about this also is it's one of those rare cases that involved radar confirmation. Uh, the Albany, Georgia airport detected an unknown target at the exact same location as the sighting. And this is uh, an example uh, for the Smithsonian Channel where we touched on this. The Project Blue Book file reveals that at the time of the pilot's sighting, the Albany airport had radar contact with the object. Evidence that this may not have been a hallucination. But despite the radar contact, the Air Force investigators reach a conclusion that surprises David Marler. The Albany, Georgia case was concluded to be the planet Venus, a visual sighting of the planet Venus, which really stretches the imagination when you look at the fact that the pilot was able to see Venus below him. I don't always agree with the Air Force's explanation of some of these sightings, but uh, the testimony that is documented within those files is beyond reproach. When we look at the characteristics, we look at the consistencies in the narratives of these individuals, when we look at the radar confirmation, there is solidity to these objects. These are not hallucinations, these are not fantasies, these are not aberrations due to atmospheric conditions. We're dealing with a real, solid, tangible reality that needs to be investigated. And we will continue to investigate as we look at some of these cases. Moving forward in 1953, this was a case that I touched on in my book. I had actually pulled it from a NICAP publication, but in going through the files, I found the original handwritten UFO report. And in this particular case, you see the triangle here with the arrow showing that the object made a flat pivot turn and then moved in a different direction. So again, just demonstrating that characteristic. Looking at Atlantic Beach, Florida, in August of 1954, multiple triangular UFOs were seen completely silent in flight. This is one of the sketches from the actual report. And zooming in, you can see this formation. The estimated 9 to 11 triangles side by side flying in a V formation. And each of these were contained in a bluish green effervescent light, is how the witness described it. And the most important thing is they were struck by the complete absence of sound. And there you can see the actual news clipping that was also contained in the UFO report to kind of supplement what they had written. Then looking into 1957, Detroit, Michigan, we have yet another formation of triangular UFOs. No, no noise is heard, which I emphasized here. And the size of the objects were estimated to be a half inch at arm's length. Uh, this is interesting uh, because in this particular case, the blue triangles, as they were described, were contained in a white glow. Then, I l love looking at these historic headlines. Uh, you can ima imagine my amazement when I'm going through the files and I stumble across this. Report sighting flying triangle over city. And this described the uh, three lights at each point, the ability to hover, and also make flat turns. Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I'm at. Uh, July 18th, 1958. This is a UFO report. And what's interesting about this one, the witness 
drew a triangle and put these little dots indicating the lights. And despite the fact that they drew that, they also indicated in the report, I couldn't see the shape behind the lights, but I'm just indicating kind of that they were in a triangular formation. And so just coloring it in, it would have looked something like that to the witness. They were described as orange lights. Um, in my book and even in the research that I'm presenting today, the cases that we're reviewing, and I believe Mark touched on this this morning during the first lecture, if you look up and just see three points of light, they may be just that. And today, they may be Navy satellites, as Mark alluded to. There are the Navy NOS satellites where it's three points of light literally moving overhead. Again, for the untrained eye, someone might look at that and think they saw a triangle. The same with these historic files. If I found cases, and there were many, where people said they saw three points of light, I do not assume, unless the witness states otherwise, that it's a triangle. I take them at the fact that it's just three individual points of light. However, if they're describing a number of lights like this, I think it's much more probable it could be affixed to an object. Looking at this, though, it made me think of a case from Tucson, Arizona, 1950. Uh, this is a rendition based on the description. They described blue lights here, and they said they were evenly spaced along the perimeter of the object. No conventional aircraft lights were seen, and you can see the description, equilateral triangle, was observed. Moving on, Majorca, Spain, May 22, 1960. Again, newspaper, sky triangle is a mystery over Madrid. What was interesting about this particular report is NICAP, the National Investigation Committee on Aerial Phenomenon, received this from NASA at their request. They had requested information and they actually sent a copy of what they called the Twix message. And uh, astronomers cited this triangular object over Spain. And I want you to remember Spain because whereas this one seems to be somewhat anomalous in nature, there's another famous case that we'll be able to explain away. Then we look at Maine, late August 1960. This was an interesting one because the sketch was done by a young girl. Uh, in, late at night, the parents and the daughter were observing uh, multiple triangular UFOs. In fact, they saw five triangles moving about in the sky. What's interesting about this, as well as some of the other cases we're going to hear, is they actually took binoculars and were able to zero in. So it wasn't just the unaided eye that they were observing this. And when they looked through the binoculars, this is what they saw. And it's one of the few sketches that we have that's actually done in crayon. <laughs> but I thought that that was rather interesting to have that color, color sketch by the daughter. And that's in the actual case file. Uh, Westbrook, Connecticut, September 1960. This was in my book as well, but I wanted to revisit it because I had photocopies of the newspaper article, but in going through the case files, I found the original newspaper. So it was really nice to have the original in this case. And multiple characteristics were described, as you can see here, in this account. This was two consecutive nights, and it was observed by two families, so multiple witnesses. In this lengthy article that describes many of these characteristics, the one that was interesting is where it says here, eerie, no noise. It was completely silent. And if we color it in, that's what it would probably have looked like. Then, Los Angeles, California, September 1960. Uh, another interesting headline, Triangle Spaceship is Sighted. Uh, I did add, thank goodness, otherwise I would have had to make a retraction in the book, that the article ended by saying, was it a balloon or a genuine UFO? I'm glad I left it as an open-ended question because going through the case files, guess what? I found additional newspapers regarding this. Wayward Flying Saucer uh, stirs a big dither in West LA. And it talks about police officers chasing this triangular object, which then dipped down to the ground. They were able to wrestle this piece that was attached to it. And what it was was a, a light, battery-operated light that was affixed to a triangular balloon. And there was a photographer with them that snapped this picture as the balloon uh, detached and went back up into the sky. So in this case, this is a triangle case that's explained. I think it's important to highlight the ones that are, have a prosaic explanation. We're not trying to find a mystery with each and every one of these. Moving into 1961, though, we have Weathersfield, Connecticut. And all of these characteristics were demonstrated. And you can see the erratic maneuver that this triangle made, just bouncing around in all different directions, according to the witness. And then when we zoom in, 
again, we have points of light making a triangular image. And in this case, not just three, but we also have these here, here, and here. So a very interesting one. And this particular one had a humming noise associated with it. It wasn't silent. Then we go to Stillwater, Minnesota, 1961. In August of that year, witness and four other people reported seeing a V-shaped object at treetop level over the St. Croix River. And you can see their sketch showing the direction that the object went. And these were two witnesses, and these are each of their sketches from the case files. And again, low altitude flight, slow speed, and silent. Toward the end of 1962, a man was hunting and noticed a dull pink diamond-shaped object overhead while his dogs were barking. This is the sketch, which I colored in, and he described it again, dull pink, diamond-shaped. And then, as he's standing there observing it, it turned bright red and divided into two triangles. And then, if that wasn't interesting enough, the two triangles took on positions where they were side by side, and then they moved off. And I think that this is an important insight into the energy output of these vehicles. We often get color changes associated with acceleration or with division or any, any one of these types of maneuvers. So this, this may give us some insights into the physics that's being employed with these objects. I found it interesting also because here we have a diamond dividing into two triangles. It made me think of another case that I had from the UK. And in this particular case, uh, this was uh, from uh, the 1980s, uh, and we had a witness and his wife that saw uh, a diamond-shaped triangular UFO hovering over a hill next to a triangular UFO. So is there a relationship between these triangles and diamonds that people are seeing? Is there a possible pattern there? Uh, then we have East Heartland, Connecticut. Uh, we have that blunt end forward maneuver that I described where you have the sketch here from the witness showing the direction of movement. And this is one that we actually had the audio recording which I digitized. And uh, this is uh, Richard Hall with NICAP and this is Don Berliner. And Don is interviewing him about UFOs and they touch on this particular case. Uh, I see over here on the right there's a large map on the wall with must be at least a hundred pins on it. Just uh, what is the significance of this? Well, those pins represent sightings only in 1963. Uh, one of those you see is a sighting on October 4th in Connecticut. Uh, the sighting was by a state representative, Mr. L.B. Martin of East Heartland, Connecticut. He saw a uh, triangular shaped object in broad daylight. Uh, this was flying with the blunt edge forward. He could see uh, distinct markings on the object, something which appeared to be a row of dots. And so that was an interesting one from a state representative. Then we have this case, uh, Baltimore, Maryland, 1964, as we enter 1964. Again, this witness had binoculars and was able to have an unafforded view of this object. And I found the commentary here interesting. I am keeping an eye open for further Delta machine information. Uh, yet another name for the triangular UFOs. And he described the lighting characteristics which would have looked something like this. And then uh, moving on, we have Pleasantville, Pennsylvania. In 1964, they were having a wave of UFO sightings of many different shapes and sizes, also triangles. Here you see the sketch showing this uh, isosceles triangle. You can see the arrow indicating direction of movement. Traveling away with a broad edge forward is how the witness described it. And in this particular case, there was no sound. And you'll hear the witness actually talk about that. If you describe it as a triangle, that's, uh, that's, that works out well. But thinking of it in terms of a total triangular shape, uh, it could be a, oh, I don't know, a broad or base of the triangle. Uh, it was very, very clear, and it was moving uh, away from us. It's true that the sharp definition was this front. In fact, I call it almost a very quick triangle. You know what I mean? It would come together very quick. Yeah, it's not even not even lateral, but what it would be with the big part out front mm -hmm. going away from us. Yeah. No. And it looked like a kind of a squashed equilateral triangle. If you, there's a name for that, but I can't. What type, type of triangle that would be? At uh, isosceles or something. Mm -hmm. Not, not the, a very flat triangle. Right. So that's a really rare one from 1964. 
1965, I sent this one to Chris Mellon because I thought he'd be particularly interested in this. They had an increase in triangular UFO reports, as we'll see, in 1965. But one of the most concerning was this one. And again, these newspaper article titles catch my attention, Triangular Soundless Craft Scene. This was over the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard and low altitude flight and silent. And what's interesting is as I started looking at this, there was one witness who was a boiler maker working at the shipyard that saw this. He said it was flying so low that the ship's lights were reflecting on the underbelly of the object. And a particular note is when I started looking at the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard history, 1965 was the first year they started servicing nuclear powered naval vessels. And I think we've all heard about a possible nuclear connection regarding UFOs, nuclear weapons, nuclear uh, storage sites. So is this yet another example of the nuclear UFO connection? Then Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, this is another one that we're actually afforded the opportunity of hearing from the witness uh, from the historic audio recordings. Just two months after the Puget Sound incident, a young man was working at a local golf course in Rochester, Minnesota, and he had a sighting which he describes here. My name is Mike Gibbons, and I live in Rochester, Minnesota. And last night, approximately 20 minutes before one, I was working at a golf course in Rochester, and I was out watering greens. And uh, at this time, I looked up into the sky and I saw uh, what I first believed to be maybe a satellite or maybe even a low-flying jet, but it wasn't accompanied by any noise. And, I, and it hovered around the golf course for approximately 10 minutes. I then went in and talked to the police and uh, they sent out a dispatch car and uh, it wasn't here when they did come, it had left just before. What I did see was... Uh, what looked like a triangle. It had uh, orange lights on it that did not blink. They were a steady light, one on every corner. Uh, it hovered around the golf course for about 10 minutes and uh, at a height which I'm not too good at, but we would say approximately three times the height of the Mayo Clinic, which is here in Rochester. And uh, it stayed around for about 10 minutes and then flew off in a southeasterly direction at a very fast speed. When it was in the area, it was making in a jerking motion back and forth and stayed around for a little bit. But uh, at the time, there was, we have another golf course in town and there was another boy down there by the name of Dave Brooks. And he also reported or had talked to me and called me out here and said that he had, uh, had seen something too. That's, a, that's about it as far as... Uh, and uh, there was no sound to it. First of all, and then after I thought, it, if it wasn't a satellite, I thought, well, maybe it's a low-flying plane. But uh, usually you can pick up the roar of an engine at any time on a plane. And in addition to the recording and to the little uh, snippet you see here, we also have a copy of the police report, uh, just uh, verifying that the police were contacted. And then in New Hampshire, the same night, again, two separate UFO reports, but the same night in New Hampshire, we had a report of this triangular UFO, which had lighting characteristics like that. And so that's interesting that we have two from the same night in 1965. Moving into August of 1965, six days after those incidents, another example of a triangular UFO, this time with a red glowing underside. This is the witness sketch, and they described that these panels on the underside were illuminated, like red lights. And th there's some UK cases that are very similar from the 1980s, 1990s that demonstrate something quite similar to that. But again, uh, we have this case on file, and uh, it does tend to match some of the others. Looking at another case from Newport News, Virginia, August 65, was this unusual object. And I won't say uh, it's totally unique, because when you look at this object, and as noted here, this was hollow in the center, I compared this because I knew of another case that Omar Fowler had in the UK that looked like this. And when we compare these side by side, they're quite similar, uh, albeit the lights seem to be on the sides as opposed to on this portion. And in the UK case, it was moving with the flat side as the leading edge. In the United States case, it was actually moving with the point forward. Richmond, Virginia, 1965. We had a UFO witness that showed what looked like initially a light then two lights with a solid object between the two, and then as the object came into view, they were able to notice that it was a triangle with a light at each point. 
which then moved off in this direction. And they've also provided a secondary sketch, a little bit larger, where we see a light, two lights, and then a triangle. And many of these initially at a distance, people will say it looked like a very bright light, and then again as it approached or turned, then they afforded this interesting view of the object. And they had amber lights in the back and a white light in front is what they described. I thought this one was interesting because the witness didn't describe it as a triangle, they described it as a heart-shaped UFO. But I think you'll agree, it definitely takes on the overall appearance of a triangle. And something that I've not heard before, the witness described frills in the back, little frills. So I don't know if that's the fancy version of the triangles, but uh, that was something I had not heard before. And it's interesting when you look at the data and you look for the patterns, but it's also these one-offs that you come across that really make you scratch your head. Uh, and that was very unusual. But again, absolutely no sound and very low altitude flight was described. Then we have a rare report from Japan. We have very few Asian uh, UFO reports in general, let alone triangular or boomerang shaped UFO reports. And this particular one, you can see the sketch there by the witness. Uh, this was actually a 12-year-old boy who reported seeing a V-shaped uh, white object fly overhead in the province of Hakido. And I found that to be interesting, but even more so, looking through the case files as they're filed chronologically, three days later, across from Hakido, across the Sea of Japan, in Taejeon, we have South Korea. We have a report of two triangular UFOs. These were reported by U.S. military personnel as documented in this written report. And you can see here the moon and these triangular objects that were seen to be moving in front of the moon. And this reminded me of one of the oldest accounts that I have when I heard about this. And uh, for those that haven't seen it, I just want to share a brief clip. The earliest account I have is 1882 that was observed and documented in Scientific American. July 3rd, 1882, Lebanon, Connecticut. Two astronomers making observations of the moon witness a strange sight. The UFOs that were reported were seen moving over the surface of the moon by astronomers. And they described not one, but two triangular dark objects moving over the lunar surface. The astronomer's report states they see two black triangular notches on the lower half of the moon. They move toward each other along the moon's edge and seem to be obliterating nearly a quarter of its surface. In the report, they offer no suggestion as to what these triangular objects could be. This is one of the earliest reports of a triangular UFO. It predates manned flight by over two decades. And then looking in 1965, as we continue towards the end of the year in December, um, before 65 ends, we have this object that was seen. It was first thought to be a jet, and it was silver in appearance, and the witness was watching it until the jet stopped in midair, and then slowly turned and accelerated away. And then in December, three days later, in Pennsylvania, we have this triangular UFO that had these lighting characteristics. And this was uh, also seen uh, with the white lights at the back end, the white light in the middle, and the red light in front. And again, 1965, it was a good year for triangles. Moving into 1966, this is an example of the triangles that glow or have an overall glowing appearance or color. And in this particular case, you can see that the object was moving and then made a sharp, flat turn and then moved off to the southwest. Maison, Illinois, March 22, 1966, three days after the incident we just talked about, a witness uh, stated that they saw six triangles that were flying over their home. One seemed to be hovering stationary while the other ones were flying around erratically. Three days after that incident, British Columbia had the beginning of a wave of UFO sightings involving a number of triangular UFOs. And again, we have these wonderful newspaper articles, women are report seeing two triangular objects, so not one but two, another example of multiple triangular UFOs. And then we have a very interesting case from Florida. 
This one I thought was one of the more incredible uh, reports in the files. You can see at the very beginning here what I cited from the report. The witness stated it appeared to be larger than a football field. What's interesting about this is, again, we got to stop and think. This is 1966. We hear this report all the time from the 1980s up till now. But to see a report from 66 describing that exact same characteristic is intriguing. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that this was a pilot that observed this object. And more specifically, he provided in the report a successive series of sketches to walk us through what it was like to experience this. Now, mind you, as he's flying, the triangular UFO was above him and descending over him. And this is what it initially appeared to look like. And as it moved down over his plane, and the scale, by the way, is not correct. It was much larger than his plane, as he noted. But the object then looked like it changed into a cone-shaped UFO, but it then flattened out into an elongated object, and, oh, there we go, and then back into this triangular object, which then quickly moved off until nothing could be seen anymore. He provides a secondary sketch, and again, the object was above him. He, he states, I'd say it was a good block in size. I could have landed on it. Uh, and he said it was never below me. This is just an example. But he stated it was so large he felt he could have landed his plane on it. Then we have Newport, New Hampshire, early mid-October 1966. We have this sketch of a triangular UFO. The witness noted it was definitely triangular in shape. It look, just looked black, like the modern accounts that we have. And uh, did the object rise or fall? No, it just cruised slowly like a very slow-moving aircraft. And they did notice a, a motor idling softly, almost a hum sound coming from this. And the lighting characteristics look like this. Red, green, and yellow lights. Fresno, California, no exact date given, but we have this object that was a very small triangle, 25 feet by 20 feet in size. And this is what the lighting characteristics look like on the UFO. Then we have an Ohio case, and I found this quote to be very interesting. Now, mind you, the size, twice the size of a 747, again in 1967, this is being reported, and then they noted flying slow and low, approximately 200 feet uh, above them. And this is the sketch. They described it as being whitish-orange, but with a red glowing center to it. And the, the flying slow and low caught my attention because that kind of echoed uh, a comment that Chris Mellon made in reference to his theory with regard to these triangular UFOs. I agree. Uh, we look at 1967. We have this interesting sketch showing a triangular UFO. Red light in front, two green lights in back, no sound noted, and something seen to leave the object and then return to it. An example of these detachable lights or objects. Then we have Santa Rosa, California, we have this UFO that was seen flying over a home. It actually flew over and physically shook the house. The family ran out, saw this object with three bright lights and flashing white lights along one side. And this is one of those strange sounds that we had. It, it was a chugging sound that the witnesses said that they heard coming from this particular object. And then in August, uh, or rather, in August of that year, we also had this boomerang-shaped object in California again, and this had a white light in the front, and it just flew over the rooftop and just cleared the trees, as you can see in both of these sketches by two different witnesses. And again, did the objects have any sound? None. Scott Air Force Base, Illinois. Uh, this is not the January 5th, 2000 case that made a lot of notoriety in the last several years. This was a case from the UFO study group of Greater St. Louis. Uh, I inherited their files in summer of 2005, and going through various boxes, I stumbled across the, upon this particular report. This is one from my book as well. The witness described this dark black object with rectangular or square windows on the side. And again, this is uh, 32 years before the January 5th, 2000 case. And I just want to share a brief excerpt because I lived in Southern Illinois at the time, decided to try to track down the witness and was successful not only in meeting with him, but securing an on-camera interview. And this is just a brief clip from that interview. 
Okay, it was uh, after dark, it was late in the evening, I'm not sure now of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we were westbound on Highway 177 uh, from Mascuta to Belleville. We were right at the east edge of Belleville on 177 and we had right in that area when one of us noticed the uh, object in the sky. And then could you just describe the object when you noticed it and then how, did it change appearance in any way, shape or form as you were obviously viewing it from different vantage points? Yes. Uh, always seemed to be in the shape of a slice of pie to me. Uh, just that uh, those dimensions had some thickness to it and sh an obvious triangular shape. Okay. And you mentioned that there were some lights or windows, as you described? There was described. A, a row of lights uh, along one side, uh, the side that, that was, there was only one side visible at a time anyway. And obviously, you described it visually. What type of noise did you hear? Absolutely silent. There wasn't a sound. There was no, no sound at all. Hypothetically, if there was a skeptic sitting here right now and they said, you just simply misidentified as a conventional military aircraft. What would be your response to someone making that statement? Well, I would, except for a few things, I would say, sure, you know, could be. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I'd, I'd sure like to see what you're talking about that, that, <laughs> that is, you know, of that shape and is silent, right. which was, that was the kicker for me. And, and I do, no noise. and again, I, I, you kind of reiterate what you reported back in 68, because if you notice on the report form there, you said no sound. None in response to the question, was there any noise? Not, not a hum. And, and not, you underlined it twice. <laughs> yeah, no noise. So in the literal sense of the term, you saw an unidentified flying object. Absolutely, and, and still uh, to this day unidentified as mm -hmm. far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. A little funny anecdote related to uh, John. Uh, when I first contacted him, he said, how in the hell did you find out about this sighting after all these years? I said, well, you filed a report for him. He goes, no, I didn't. I said, yeah, you did. And we went back and forth arguing on the phone, but I didn't want to irritate him too much. I wanted to get to his house so I could do this on-camera interview. And after I interviewed him, uh, he said again, I don't know how you found out about this. I said, well, you filed a f report. No, I didn't. And he looked at his wife who was sitting there. And I looked at her and I smiled and I slid the report over to him. I said, flip over to page two. Is that your signature? And he flipped it over and he looked at her, looked at me, looked uh, over at my friend that was uh, doing the camera work, looked back down, looked at me. He goes, I'll be damned. He goes, I don't remember filing it, but that's my signature. Long story short, he did remember later, there was a gentleman who worked uh, with him who was a member of the St. Louis Study Group of Greater St. Louis, and that is how we were able to get this documented. Now, that was at the end of 1967. In 1968, this was a very intriguing case that actually made the newspaper, but we also have the case file. There was a motorist that was driving down the highway in South Corning, New York. Uh, earlier, about a mile or two prior to seeing this triangle, he saw this red light that was moving around, bobbing around. It was very unusual. It disappeared, and as he continued driving, he noticed this triangular object, which was moving with the flat side towards him. The road actually goes up at an incline, and there's this huge ravine, and he saw this triangle clear over these trees and then drop down into the ravine to where as he pulled over curbside, he could look down and see the triangle from above, which is a very interesting uh, aspect to this particular case. And he did notice that there was an associated sound with this as well. Uh, looking to the Madrid, Spain case that I promised to uh, reflect on, this is probably the most well-publicized triangular UFO report in the history of all triangular UFO reports up until probably the Belgian wave. Um, here you see UFO outraces Spanish jet, triangular UFO eludes, eludes jet as Madrid watches, and just one example of the foreign newspapers we also have. This hit the international news wires, and this is why. Uh, you had Spanish jets chasing this UFO. We had this photograph of the purported triangular UFO. And it was not only seen on September 5th, it was also seen on September the 7th. 
which is interesting, little side note, I was born between those two days on September 6th, 1968. Uh, no, no correlation, I'm sure. But this gives you just a small example. There were thousands, if not tens of thousands of witnesses that looked up and saw this purported triangular UFO. It made lots of headlines. But as the newspaper articles continued to come out, I started to question it when I started looking at this because now they were reporting the UFO as a pyramid in the sky, flying pyramid over Madrid. And looking at the additional data in the case file, it wasn't just a pyramid, it was an inverted pyramid. And it turned out to be a French meteorological balloon. And for those that are skeptical of that, this is the report that we have in the case file from Madrid uh, as part of the official NICAP file. According to the director of the Institute of Meteorology, the object which tied up Madrid traffic more than one hour, which was pursued by Spanish F-104 jets up to 50,000 feet before they gave up, was an atmospheric probe launched at Landis in southern France. The reason the jets couldn't reach it, the balloon had ascended to such a high altitude. It was impossible to reach it. And we have this uh, original with the signature of the director of the meteorological group from Madrid, Spain in the original NICAP case file that was sent to NICAP as part of their request for information. Now, I say this because it's important. Um, in the last year or two, some of these purported videos of UFOs surfaced, one being triangular UFOs seen over a naval vessel, and another researcher uh, cited this particular footage as complementary to that sighting. This was Soviet military footage that was taken over Riga, Latvia, just 30 days prior to the Madrid, Spain case. And if you look at this, and you look at the French balloons, if you look directly up at it, it does look like a triangle. But it looks like there's some type of package or payload here where the points actually taper down. So I really don't believe that this is a legitimate uh, triangular UFO uh, video, nor do I believe that the photograph taken over Madrid based on the available information was. So again, not all triangles are mysterious. Some have conventional explanations. Now, East Hartford, Connecticut, uh, March 27, 1969. This is another case involving a motorist where the triangle was hovering stationary, estimated to be a thousand feet in altitude. The motorist turned off her vehicle, radio, rolled down the window, and then the UFO began to pass directly overhead and there was absolutely no sound. It moved an estimated 40 to 60 miles an hour, according to the witness. In Indianapolis, uh, no specific date, but September of 69, we have a very detailed report. Uh, the witness stated, the lights definitely were affixed to the points of the triangle. And most strangely, I did not hear even a suggestion of a sound at all. And I do have normal hearing, the witness went on to add. But this is the sketch. And I think you would agree that this is very typical of the modern triangular UFOs that are being reported today. And I know we have some MUFON investigators in the room that would probably agree. Uh, looking at October 69, as we move forward in time, yet another report of multiple triangular UFOs. The witness didn't want to report this, thinking it might have been jets, but they went on to state that the fact that there was no sound prompted the witness to file a report. And then back to British Columbia, we have yet another report of a triangle. This is one of those very unusual ones that was cited uh, November, December of 69. Again, no specific date, unfortunately. The triangle was observed initially like this, but then the witness stated later that the form changed and then assumed a disc form, actually changed shape, according to the witness. Sebring, Ohio, June 7, 1970. This is a very interesting one, and I wish the story would happen to me. Uh, a group of UFO researchers were leaving a UFO, uh, local monthly UFO meeting and part of the Cleveland UFO group. And they were heading home and saw this triangular UFO. You can see the direction of flight indicated here. This was the leading edge with this trailing. This is another witness sketch showing their vehicle and showing the direction that it moved. And then this is Mr. Earl Neff. For those that are familiar with 1960s ufology, Earl was one of the more credible, more prolific writers and lecturers on the UFO subject. Uh, he had established himself as a very credible UFO researcher of the time. And this is his personal sketch of what he saw 
a gray body, white light in the back, and red and green alternating lights. And again, you can see the direction of movement, the flat side as the leading edge. Then between Salina and Abilene, Kansas, we have uh, three objects that were sighted in succession. We had initially a report of an object that was described as the circular light. Then they saw a rectangular shape, and they went on to state that there was some type of superstructure or struts or structural steel girders that were part of the structure of this object. And then the third object, they agree, was triangular with three prominent white lights, one at each corner. No surprise there. And they were clearly seen to be moving easily short distances away from each other. They actually described it as a ballet in the sky, the way these objects were moving around each other. Uh, again, uh, triangles seen with non-triangular UFOs. And again, we have many cases on file. These are two cases I talk about in my book. And even January 5th, 2000, Southern Illinois, there may have been a rectangular UFO seen in conjunction with the triangle. Then in Washington, as we get into 1970, this object was sighted, and it was sighted not only by the naked eye, but again, with binoculars. And the witness stated it was a triangle with a bank of white lights on the bottom and red lights near the rear of the object. 1971, Annapolis, Maryland. This is one where they describe the size as being huge, 400 to 500 by 300 feet estimate, and utter silence as it sailed among the stars on a clear, windless night. This was actually a husband and wife, and the above sketch is the wife's sketch, and this is the husband's. Bayside, New York, uh, September 1972, multiple UFOs seen again, and they appeared to be uh, a solid with a white glow and panels that were evident on the underside. And an interesting aspect of the flight, they said they were moving along and then one object broke ranks and they said it was like the missing man formation, the aerial uh, salute to fallen military heroes. The one just kind of shot off from the rest of the formation. And then another case from New York was in October 72, October 9th. And you can see here, silently approaching, and a rather, uh, this is one of the more detailed sketches that we, that we receive. Not all are this artistic in nature. Then Vermont, August 1973, an excellent example of showing how these triangular UFOs will be moving, and then suddenly flip and make a flat turn and then move in another direction. This was a sketch that I found in two file cabinets of just random papers, going through these and trying to sort them. Uh, this case was from Hearst, Texas, and this was in October 73 and was very similar to contemporary reports that we have on file of the modern triangular UFOs with the lighting characteristics. And then Rosebud, Texas, yet another Texas case, 73, triangular UFO follows Texas women in car and it's rather interesting uh, because they claim that this triangle paced their vehicle. And I've gotten a lot of reports from the UK and the United States where people say it followed them or it hovered directly over their car. Uh, I did a, an over-the-phone interview with a UK family and they said they were driving in their vehicle on one of the motorways in England and they looked up through the sunroof and this object was just keeping pace with them. Uh, it seems like they tend to follow the motorways and the interstates in a number of cases that I found. Uh, in Illinois, 1974, we have this report. This was a letter to Dr. J. Allen Hynek wanting to report this UFO from October 1974. And this is what the object looked like when we color it in based on the witness description. And then Seaside, Oregon. I thought this was a rather pretty sketch. This very bright blue was... Uh, what the witness was trying to capture. Uh, they stated that the, the lights were not like conventional aircraft lights. They had a very unusual bright blue color as demonstrated in this sketch. And then we come to 1975, Lumberton, North Carolina. I've lectured on this before briefly. Now I have the original case file and the notes of Dr. J. Allen Hynek. My friend Lee Spiegel, very young Lee Spiegel there, uh, was actually dispatched down to North Carolina at the behest of Dr. J. Allen Hynek to go investigate this series of sightings. And the sightings occurred from April 3rd to April 9th, and just as soon as they began, they stopped. All of the reports involved triangular UFOs, and the ma vast majority were police officers. These are just some of the police officers that were witness to the events during that time. 
Interesting side note, this doesn't often happen. We had Lee go down there and he told Dr. Hynek, and you may have heard Lee talk about this on his podcast or his show. He said, I was disappointed. He goes, I always wanted to see a classic flying saucer. And Dr. Hynek had to correct me. He goes, no, Lee. He goes, they're not describing flying saucers. They're describing flying triangles. And he goes, I was disappointed. And Hynek even said, well, if you want me to send somebody else, he goes, no, you're Dr. Hynek. I'm not going to say no to Dr. Hynek. I will go down there. He literally got to the police station in Lumberton. And he's still friends, by the way, with Ron Thompson, pictured here. And I'm in correspondence with Ron as well to this day. Uh, he got there, and he started taking notes. While he was taking notes and interviewing the police officers, they got dispatch calls over the radio that unusual lights were being seen again. So they drove out to the field where these police officers had sighted the triangle the night before. And this is a recreation done by Dale Hendrickson, a professional artist who's worked on the Simpsons series. And they noticed that over this row of trees, they could see a white light that suddenly appeared. And as they stood there watching it, it silently started moving towards them and then this object appeared over them, completely silent, and shone a spotlight down. And this is Lee in amazement, you know, stepping back. But uh, the object shone the light down, the light then turned off, and then the object just casually drifted away. But they were taking him there to show him where they saw the triangle the night before. And now here, Lee, an investigator, is now an eyewitness to the actual object itself. And we do have uh, a very thick case file on this because there were numerous reports from that time period. I found this one to be one of the most intriguing notations that I found in the case file. Police officer was sitting in the car. The UFO came 200 feet above his car. He got out. Uh, the object started to slowly move, and it was moving away, and it put a spotlight on the officer. And then he started to follow it in his car and clocked it at 200 miles an hour with his speed gun. So here's another example of radar uh, looking at that. So low altitude flight, beams of light emitted. Um, this was almost prophetic. In going through Dr. Hynek's personal correspondence regarding the case, this is a letter that Hynek was writing in December of that year, still investigating the case. And it was almost prophetic because he really articulates what I wrote about in my book years later. We feel that those reported sightings have some validity as genuine unexplained phenomena because of a combination of factors. V-shaped or delta-shaped objects reportedly and independently seen by 23 observers, absence of noise, ability to hover for an extended period at low altitude, and the ability of the object to make flat turns and as opposed to banked turns and the object was seen at treetop level and would often descend below treetop level, level several times. And the object's lighting configurations were not compatible with conventional aircraft lights of the time. Well, after the Lumberton, North Carolina wave in Idaho, we had uh, two triangular UFOs that were observed as documented in the newspapers of the time. And then in Illinois, we have women who observed a flying triangle and then El Lago, Texas, we had an, yet another motorist. And this motorist, like the previous one we talked about, stopped the car, turned off the car radio, rolled down the window. The object came overhead and made absolutely no sound. This sketch, when I first saw it, immediately jogged my memory. This is a case from Minnesota, 1980. And I would argue these are pretty damn close to one another as far as you'd almost swear that they saw the same thing. And then in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, this is an interesting one, a uh, father was taking his son trick-or-treating. And he, along with a number of other trick-or-treaters and parents, saw this triangular object. And this one was described as being as large as a volleyball at arm's length, which is fairly significant in size. And again, uh, silent flight was noted in this particular instance. Then we have another audio recording, this time from the very early years of the National UFO Reporting Center. I love when you can hear the description in the witness's own words. This is just some excerpts from a report that they received from uh, near Odessa, Washington in 1976. And we've been advised that uh, you were in a party that uh, spotted an unidentified flying object the night of the 25th. That's correct. I wonder if we could get a description of exactly what you saw. Well, at first I thought it was just a great big plane. 
But uh, it, it stopped and hovered right over the, our car. On, we were on our way to town. I saw a triangular-shaped vehicle. Uh-huh. Um, it, ha- it looked like it was a double-decker, if that's possible. <laughs> and the middle part had two great, huge lights, like, I don't know, just great big round lights. Were those white lights? Yes. Okay. And then underneath, it looked like there were a lot of multicolored lights. I saw mostly red. My daughter said she saw green. I didn't. Okay. But I saw mostly red and white. And I was driving, so I didn't get to observe as much as as my passengers. Okay. But that's essentially what I saw. And there was no sound. Uh, We rolled down the window. All we could hear was the motor of our car. Do you have any estimate of altitude? At its lowest point? I would I would say that was its lowest point. Would okay. be Would be 200 yards or so. How about size? It was big, but I would say as big or bigger than, than a 747. It was wider across. It was probably as long as a 747, but it was wider across. And in the following year, 1977, we have an incident very similar, similar to the Lumberton, North Carolina wave that occurred. Uh, multiple police officers from various precincts in and around Memphis, Tennessee, describe seeing this large triangular object. And one particular officer would talk about it for many, many years after. Uh, his name was Officer Lamar Todd. And he even, just not too many years ago, did a, an interview for PBS. And this is some of the testimony where you hear the fact that not only he described and saw this object, multiple officers spanning a period of miles around Memphis also observed it. It was hard to judge the distance to the lines and it, but it was triangular in shape, had three lights on the sides. We could see that very well. We watched it for about four or five minutes. Uh, Jerry jumped into the van real quick. He was a sniper assigned. Took out the rifle with the scope that he was assigned to look at it closely with the scope. Well, as the rifle came out, it started to move off. Uh, In a matter of a second, it took off north, uh, no wind noise, no motor noise, no rocket propulsion noise, nothing. Uh, It disappeared across the horizon, which was roughly 14 to 16 miles in a matter of a second, second and a half. In a few minutes, the dispatcher asked me to give her a call. I called her. She said she had several more reports of the same type, same description that had come in from some of our officers at the North Precinct. There was three more up there and a trooper in Brownsville and a trooper in Alamo. And this is a matter of uh, about the same time I'm putting it out they're seeing it up there too, so it's very quickly. I really like uh, working with police officers on these UFO sightings. I have not had the opportunity to interview uh, Lamar Todd in person. Something that brings us back to the beginning of our presentation. Note the date, May 17, 1977. The movie Star Wars was officially released uh, eight days after this Memphis, Tennessee sighting. So. So much for cultural influences on UFO witnesses, according to David Clark in the UK. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) So, in conclusion, these triangles, as I've stated in my book, are nothing new. Triangles have been ever-present in the UFO data. Reports are consistent in their detailed narratives, and a military explanation for the entire history of reports is illogical, although we must admit or concede that some modern reports could have that in the mix. And such beliefs suggest a revisionist history of aviation and aerospace technology bordering on what I believe the delusional, to think that we had exotic aircraft like this decades ago and we're still engaged in developing inferior technologies. And common characteristics continue to exist with new data sets we examine. Just a couple brief updates I'm very excited about. I mentioned my friend Philip Mantle at the beginning in the UK. Philip has been investigating the subject for approximately 30 to 40 years, and he has an extensive archive, and within the last year, he made an official announcement that he's going to be shipping about a pallet worth of UFO data and information and case files to my home in Albuquerque, New Mexico. 
So what information, what triangle cases and other information may we have in that data set? In addition, this was not part of my PowerPoint because this literally was solidified about two days before I came out here. Um, uh, a dear friend of mine, Mr. Antonio Huneas, who Forrest knows quite well, uh, who used to be a regular speaker here on uh, many, many occasions, uh, contacted me. Approximately four years, uh, four years ago, I bought his extensive foreign UFO case file collection, which covers almost every country. Uh, he also has an extensive library of rare books, journals of all different countries from South America, Europe, and elsewhere. Uh, and I will be uh, heading there uh, where he lives two weeks from tomorrow, flying out one way, renting a 20-foot U-Haul truck, and loading up his entire uh, collection of foreign books, journals, and materials, many of which date back to the 1950s. So. The point is that the archive that I have in New Mexico continues to grow. We continue to get new data acquisitions. And with these collections, uh, we can hopefully find more cases, more information. I look at all of these as data points. All of these citing reports are data points. And so it's something to keep in mind. One of the reasons that Antonio as well as Philip are sending their material to me is because I've been working very closely with the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. I've actually lectured on the UFO subject at the university. They have an exhaustive microfilm collection, just rows and rows of rare newspapers. Contrary to popular opinion, for those that love the internet, many of these newspapers have never been digitized. The only way you're going to find the data is to go through the microfilm, which is a laborious process and one that I've done many, many times at UNM. So just with regard to talking about historical material, if you or someone you know has uh, historical rare materials related to the UFO subject, UFO case files, just make plans for their future preservation because these are cases where we're preserving these collections. I cannot tell you how many researchers from the 50s and 60s, when they died, researchers would contact their family and say, well, what are you going to do with your late husband's material? Oh, we threw it all in the trash last week. We've lost so many collections. So let's try not to reinvent the wheel. Let's try to preserve the data that's out there. Let's try to make sense out of it. And let's try to educate people on the history of this incredible phenomenon with the acknowledgement that history is only one small part of this puzzle, of this mystery. Ray Hernandez was talking about consciousness and exploring consciousness. I completely agree. All of us bring something to the table, and that's wonderful about this conference. Each one of us comes at it from a different angle, but collectively, if we put all of our information together, we may have a grand understanding one day of the subject matter. And there's great work being done official agencies acknowledging the UFO subject, UAP detection systems. There are several exciting projects underway to collect real-time UFO data, the UAP military encounters that we've heard about, and field investigations by MUFON and independent investigators. So we can all work collaboratively and hopefully one day have answers to this mystery. Thank you.